Thank you. That's my talk. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> Catherine says, great, time for coffee and cookies. Welcome. That was wonderful. I love Asha started doing that. She started doing these little video clips. I really like that. That was beautiful. Thank you so much. <sighs> welcome. Welcome, welcome. I'm glad to see you. My topic today, not all those who wander are lost. I've just been walking around saying that to myself for about a week. I just love it. It comes from one of my favorite authors, which is J.R.R. Tolkien. For those of you who have spent more than five minutes in my presence, you know that I am a huge Lord of the Rings fan. I just am, and it's not because I get to look at Viggo Mortensen, even though that doesn't hurt. <laughs> it's because I love the story. This quote, not all those who wander are lost, is from his book, The Fellowship of the Ring, which is the first book in the trilogy, The Lord of the Ring. Who here is familiar with that story? Yes, have we read the book? We've seen the movies. The movies are actually excellent. They, they're, they're a rare case of actually doing, uh, doing service to the books. But they're a wonderful story. The full poem reads as follows. All that is gold does not glitter. Not all those who wander are lost. The old that is strong does not wither. Deep roots are not reached by the frost. From the ashes a fire shall be woken, a light from the shadows shall spring. Renewed shall be blade that was broken, the crownless again shall be king. The second verse does not have a whole lot to do with my talk, but it's so beautiful. Isn't it nice just to say stuff like that every yeah. now and then? Yeah. It's just beautiful. Do you feel the energy? Yeah. I just love these poetic, beautiful verse. Within the plot of the book, the poem refers to a central character, Aragorn, for those who know the story, who's destined to become king, but for a moment is living among the rest of us as a wanderer. The poem says that not, is all, not all is as it appears. Appearances are misleading. Gold does not always glitter. Not all who wander are lost. The old that is strong does not wither, and deep roots are not reached by the frost. We think that age means decline, but age often means survival and strength. Age means that you have lived through the vicissitudes of youth, that you are still here, that you are still strong, that you are still offering, you are still flourishing. Deep roots, we look at winter, we think, well, roots, it's, it's winter, nothing's happening, everything is dead. That's not true. They are not reached by the frog. They, they preserve life. They are holding life to come forward in the spring. Again, all is not as it appears. In the second verse, the poem states that the promise of truth will appear, that mere appearances will fall away. That what we think is true will simply appear. And that what is misleading and is just an appearance will fall away. If you know the story of Aragorn, that is exactly what happens as his journey unfolds. Along the way, he and several of his friends meet many perils. He confronts his fears. Uh, Frodo and Sam go take the ring into Mordor. Evil is conquered, and Aragorn is crowned king. It's a beautiful story of courage and hope and survival and resilience and overcoming. And if you're not familiar with it, I encourage you to take a look at it. In our culture, we often receive messages that if we are wandering, we are lost. If we don't have a direction, if we don't have a goal, we are just clueless. We don't know where we're going. I started thinking about that, the value of our journeys and the meaning of journeying. What does it mean to be on a journey? What does it mean to be going forward? Do we have to have a direction? Do we have to know we're going from A to B? It struck me that being lost, or better yet, telling ourselves that we are lost, on a journey is one of the main, many ways that we limit ourselves. We limit our experience of life. It's one of the many ways we deprive ourselves of the wonderful creation that is right before us, of the profound lessons that we are almost tripping over in our rush to get from A to B. We deny ourselves the gift of awakening. That's why I like what was up there. There's, there's slides, be happy, awaken, persevere, keep going. Remember the slide of the windy road. We didn't know what was around the corner. My favorite slide was the challenger. 
taking off, be adventurous or something, I was like, oh my God. Imagine those people who took off in something like that in the first rockets. They didn't know, but the spirit of courage, the spirit of adventure, the spirit of yes, I can do that, propelled them literally into the heavens. Think about that. As in Tolkien's poem, the notion that we are lost, it also conceals a greater truth. We may be wandering. We may have detoured. We may not know what is around the next corner, but we are not lost. One of the messages that we need to take away from here today is that on our journey of unfolding, each of us is exactly where we need to be. We are exactly where we need to be. Let's take a breath and just sit with that for a minute. You are just where you need to be. We think we are lost when we find ourselves in a place we didn't plan to be. Why do we think we have that much control? Do we think that we can plan every step of the way? Do we think that life holds no mystery? Do we think that we, we always know what's coming next? What arrogance is that? We don't. Remember how we say in New Thought that we are co-creators? Let's focus on the co. We are not creating the whole thing. We are in cahoots with spirit. We are held in the light. We are held in arms that carry us to where we need to go, even though we may not see over that next horizon. We like to think we are masters of the universe. I like to think I'm a master of the universe. I am master of none. And I suspect that we all find, as life brings us forward, that we are masters of none. So you know me, when I'm preparing talks, I get on the greatest authority, it's Google. And so I looked up the word wander. And I went to the authoritative source, which would be dictionary.com. Huh? Oh, KatherineWebster.com. I know, but I just went to dictionary.com. So you're entirely right. Next time I'll try Webster. But Webster would probably read something like this. The definition of wander is to ramble without a definite purpose or objective, to roam, rove, or stray. Okay, now do any of those sound good? Do any of those sound productive? Melanie, what did you do today? I just basically wandered. I strayed. I roved. It's like, how useless are you? But I would suggest that wandering with a spirit of adventure, of creativity, of acceptance, of excitement, is often the most productive and the most meaningful thing we can do. I remember once, when I was about 14 or 15, I went on a canoe trip with a friend of mine. We were whitewater rafting, and we were going to whitewater raft down uh, some, the rivers in the Finger Lakes, up in the Adirondacks. And we were going to be four or five days in a canoe shooting the rapids. As a side note, this was back in the day before people believed in things like life preservers. <laughs> and if you wore one, it meant you were a sissy. <laughs> so we're all very lucky that I'm here today, but that's another story. Okay, so I'm getting ready to go on this trip, and my father, who was a businessman and very organized, looked at me and he said, well, I need your itinerary. I said, what? He says, I need your itinerary. I said, Dad, I'm going on a canoe trip. Hit the water and go. That was the itinerary. And he actually never got my itinerary, but that was a funny story. <laughs> Mark Nepo, in his Book of Awakening, which is one of my favorite books. Are you all familiar with Mark Nepo and the Book of Awakening? If you don't have it, get it. We'll put it up on the website. It is a great book. He tells a story called Beneath Arriving. And it's about the need to just be on the journey. Let me tell you briefly what he says. It's, it's prefaced by a quote from a lady named Megan Scribner who says, I'm only lost if I'm going someplace in particular. Think about that. If you don't have a destination, proof positive, you're not lost. You're just journeying. And he writes that a friend of his was traveling around Europe city to city, and despite her plans, her interests always drove her in different directions and a path unfolded that she did not foresee. Each point of discovery led to the next, as if some logic out of mind, out of view, were guiding her. During this phase of her journey, though she often wasn't sure where she was, she never felt lost. It was when she needed to arrive at a certain station, at a certain destination, that she felt she was off course. She had strayed. 
she was lost and she wasn't sure where she was supposed to be. All of this led her to realize that the more narrow her intentions on any one day, the more she felt behind, late and lost. When she widened her net of designs, she realized that she was not lost. She realized that she was a journey where she was on a journey where she was learning and experiencing, and she was doing exactly what she needed to do. When she limited herself and she said, I need to be an X, that is when she felt deficient, lost, or out of control. There will be times when we need to find our very precise way, Nemo goes on. But more often than not, our image of the destination is only a starting point that we cling to needlessly. When we can free up our sense of needing to arrive in a certain place, we lessen the weight of being lost. And once beneath arriving and beneath our fear of failing to arrive, the real journey begins. So let's expand this thought. Let's pretend we're not on a geographic trip. Don't we all have notions of where we need to be in our lives? Don't we have notions of where I'm X age? Don't I need to have accomplished this? Don't I need to be there? That person has done better than me. That person has books, a blog, a website. So what is it about me? Why have I not achieved that goal? Why have I not reached my destination? We're all about reaching the goal. We're all about reaching the destination. We want to shortcut the trip, and we want to get to where we're going. We want to be there. We don't want to mess with the journey. We just want to be there. Am I the only one who ever feels that way? No. I think a lot of us feel that way. I got online, and you're all going to want to write this down. I found out that for less than $200, I can download a program that guarantees me spiritual awakening in 30 days. <laughs> I am not making that up. And how cool is that? For less than $200, a good investment. Hundreds of years of spiritual wisdom revealed in increments of less than 15 minutes. I can reach awakening on 400. I can do it on my car. I'll be driving along. Thousands of years of wisdom on my CD player. See me after the service and I will give you the link. <laughs> and we'll meet back in 30 days and see how far we've gone. But that's what I'm talking about. Spiritual awakening in 30 days. What are we talking about? Did the Buddha take 30 days? No. He was out there for years. We are in a rush. We are men and women on a mission. We live life with a laser focus on what's next. We don't worry about where we are. We focus on what's next. We are done with where we are, and we are moving on. That's our culture, especially in the West. But there's some problems with that. The first problem is that destinations change. They're elusive. You get to a destination, I'm here, I have a new job, I have the job I want. Okay, now I'm worried about getting a promotion. Now I'm worried about whether my boss likes me. Now I'm worried about whether that client's going to come back. The destination changes. You're on a trip. You arrive at a city. Okay, now it's time to get the souvenirs. Now it's time to plan for the next spot. Now it's time to make this restaurant at 9 o'clock. And you, you never just rest in the adventure of the moment. We've become a people where destination is the goal, haven't we? We just tick it off. We have a to-do list. Tick, tick, tick. We don't focus on the getting there, on the doing, as Asha pointed out on the, or as Chris pointed out when she was reading, on the being. If you have the mindset your purpose is to continue to reach the goal, the goalposts will always be shifting. Don't you find that to be true? They always move. Second, if our mindset is that we just need to reach that destination, how much do you miss along the way? How much do you not notice? How much do you not see? How much do you not experience? Reverend Larry Peacock, in his book, Openings, he tells the story of a traveler to Ireland who, driving along some small country roads, got lost. She stopped a gentleman walking along the road, and she rolled down her window, and she asked him, do you know the way to Kildare? And he stopped, and he leaned in the window, and in his thick Irish accent, he said, do you have time to go the beauty way? <laughs> Think about that. Do you have time to go the beauty way? Do we have time to go the beauty way? Or do we just have to step on the gas and get to kill there? Beauty way. 
Yeah, the beauty way. Do we have time to stop and go the way that brings us the greatest gifts, that brings us the greatest awakening, the greatest flowering, the greatest beauty, along which we can notice, we can see each other, we can experience the wonderful creation that is right before us. Do we have time to do that? Yes, the answer is yes. We always have time to do that. We need to take the time to do that. But I was struck by that question. And it's a question we all need to ask ourselves. Do we have time to go the beauty way, to stop and see what is before us, to be present to the small miracles that are before us every day? <coughs> so how do we take the beauty way? If we're walking out of here, we're, we're going to have that concept in our minds. How do we do it? Well, one way we do it, and we all know the answer. This is one thing I love about talks. People say, I like to go to learn things. I will tell you, when you come to a talk, you don't learn anything new. My goal is to remind us of what you always do. The answers are in this room. Our job in community is just to remind ourselves that we are held in spirit, that we all have time to take the beauty way. So we remain present. We remain open with our hearts open to what is in front of us, to what is out there, to what may be coming, even though we may not see it. And we certainly do not plan it. But we remain eager to the possibilities that are before us. Anne Mortifee writes in Love with the Mystery, the following. When a path opens before us that leads we know not where, don't be afraid to follow it. Our lives are meant to be mysterious journeys, unfolding one step at a time. Don't be afraid to lose your way. Out of chaos, clarity will eventually arise. Out of not knowing, something new and unknown will ultimately come. Do not order things too swiftly. Wait, and the miracle will appear. Does this resonate with you? We wait, and the miracle will appear. The understanding appears. We find meaning on our path when the time is right. We cannot rush it. I have a vegetable analogy. <laughs> when you go to the store, my wife does this because she's the cook. We'll go to the store and she'll tell me to buy tomatoes or apples or something, so I'll come back and she'll say, oh, those were artificially ripe and they're worthless. <laughs> you ever get those? They're beautiful, they're red, they're the right color, but you open them and it's like, what is that? And it's because it was rushed. The same is true with us on our journey. The process of awakening, the process of learning, of unfolding, we cannot rush it. You can't make a rose bloom faster than it's going to. Because that's not the way spirit's creation works. The Israelites didn't wander in the desert for a week and a half. Why is that? Okay, now that's not historical fact, at least in my view. But we are told that they wandered for 40 years. 40 is a number of preparation, of testing, of trial. The fact that the number 40 is used for that metaphor means something. It means that they had to go through a journey. They had to go through a transition of a mindset, a consciousness of being in Egypt, symbolizing bondage, to travel to the promised land, symbolizing a higher consciousness. That is the lesson for us. You don't do that fast. They had to learn lessons in those 40 years, as we do on the journeys that we take. And we learn them at our own pace, in our own way, as our hearts open to what is ours to learn. Don't feel bad because it doesn't always happen in a rush. This is a hard lesson for me because I tend to compare myself with a whole lot of other people as I'm sure the rest of you do. It is a hard lesson to say, spirit is unfolding me in spirit's own time. And I just go, <laughs> if you must, you know? Okay, yes, sometimes I talk to God. I know God is all of us. We are all part of it. But sometimes I just speak out, as do, as do many of us. Sometimes, if we are in challenging situations, it is not easy to wait for the miracle. It is not easy to wait for the gift. Trusting the journey through hard times is not easy. We sometimes feel lost. We feel separated from God. One of the things we teach here 
is that if we listen, that small, still voice will come to us. What if it doesn't? What if we're sitting here and listening, and all we're hearing is the air conditioner? That's not good news. Sometimes we have to wait. Sometimes it's not time for that voice to take us by the hand and lead us out. We are not done. But we have to trust that it is coming. We don't all get pillars of fire, bushes that burn but are not consumed, angels appearing at the foot of our bed. Um, I personally have never had any of those. <laughs> I'm still open to the experience. <laughs> But it doesn't matter, because I still know that Spirit holds me, sustains me, envelops me. I just know it. It is a matter, not even of belief, it is a matter of knowing. And if you can have that certainty, then it doesn't matter that something next to you does not burst into flame. That would be kind of cool, but we don't necessarily need it. I rely on the certainty in my heart that creation is a work powered by love. And it is the most powerful force we know. I know that darkness will always be overcome by light. I know that to be a fact. Even if I am challenged and battered and beaten, I know that the capacity of the human heart to overcome, to love, to hope is unparalleled. And it resides in each of us. John Wesley is a Methodist theologian, and he coined the concept of what he called prevenient grace. This is why I leave you notepads. <laughs> you don't have to write that down, I'm just kidding. Prevenient grace is the notion that even when we feel lost, even when we feel alone, we feel separated, God's love is still there, waiting for us, to reach out our finger like that picture on the Sistine Chapel. Remember I talked about that once? Adam and God on the roof of the Sistine Chapel. God is straining toward Adam as far as he can go, straining. Adam is lying back, just a guy, lying back, and his finger is down like this, and the only thing that's needed to make the connection is for Adam to lift his finger, and the energy will flow. That's all that is needed. Spirit is always there, waiting for us to reach out and connect. Miracles will unfold, even on journeys where we feel lost. We will discover strength, compassion, resilience, and love, even when our paths take turns that we don't expect. Has everybody here lived a life where every step you knew was going to unfold as you thought it would? Has anybody's life taken a few twists and turns that we didn't expect? Show of hands. Everyone? Yes. That's the lesson. That's the journey. That's what makes us spiritual beings in this wonderfully human body. It's a gift. Unexpected twists and turns are a gift. We learn that since we can't predict, we can't control, our strength and our confidence comes through trust through knowing that we are continually sustained by light, by love, by spirit. Matthew Fox tells the story of a Reverend Fred Shuttlesworth, who was a minister in Birmingham, Alabama, during the Civil Rights uh, Movement. Reverend Shuttlesworth, in the minority at that point, continued to fight for equality, for justice, for the right thing, even though... He was beaten and his children were jailed. Their, his kids were 8 and 10. They were put in jail and he was beaten three times. When asked where he got his courage, he replied, you may call it courage, I call it trust. It was trust. Knowing that even if he didn't know what was next, he knew who was with him. He knew what power was sustaining him, and he knew what he had to do in order to be in integrity, to fulfill who he had come here to be. He knew that even though he was walking through hard times, he was not walking alone. And the same is true of us. We are also reshaped by our journeys. During time where we feel lost, where we feel unsure, if we wait for the process to unfold, if we are just patient and we trust, the answers 
will arise. Just as in Tolkien's poem, the truth will appear and the illusion, the fear, the uncertainty will fall away. If we believe, as we say we do, that it's all God, then we never need to fear the next step. We never need to fear the next corner, even though we can't see around it. Let me leave you with a quote from John Shar. He, wrote, he writes this, The future is not some place we are going, but one we are creating. The paths are not to be found, but made. And the activity of making them changes both the maker and the the destination. We do not know where our journeys are taking us. We even can't see around the next corner, the next horizon. We don't know what tomorrow brings. But we are never lost. We are always in the mind, the contemplation, the embrace of the divine. And that gives us confidence that our unfolding is always to our greater good. Let's take these thoughts in.